Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a, a very great pleasure to be here, and particularly uh, a privilege to be able to be in conversation uh, for a short time with Joanna Mackle. And um, Joanna, the warmest of welcomes uh, to this. It's a lovely opportunity to be able to speak with you. And, and just before we hear about the British Museum, which I'm, I'm very keen to ask you about, can you tell us a little bit about the, the story behind the Renaissance de Goya exhibition, uh, which people can see upstairs, and having seen it yesterday, it is an absolutely stunning and intriguing collection. How did it come to be here? Well, we have the curator in the front row, Mark MacDonald, who really is the mastermind behind all of this. He's the expert on old master drawings, Spanish drawings in the BM. And it, even before he was at the BM, we were collecting in the 19th century Spanish, Spanish prints and drawings. And this was really a work of scholarship that Mark pulled together. Um, we have about two million works of art on paper at the British Museum. It's a huge collection. Um, and so because it can't be seen all the time, we have to rotate it. Um, but when we put together an exhibition like this, um, which I say is an incredible survey of 300 years of, of Spanish prints and drawings, um, Velázquez de Goya, it's a, it's a, I can't commend it enough, enough to you. When we create an exhibition like this, we like to take it um, to different locations because there's only a limited amount of time that this can be shown to the public. So this is really a once in a lifetime opportunity and it's our way of making public in the, more, in the broadest possible way this extraordinary collection as well as it being digitized because that's another way that we make this, this public. Well, it's a, a wonderful opportunity for the Art Gallery of New South Wales to be able to show this exhibition. And uh, again, I hope you all make the opportunity to go and have a look at it. But going back now to, um, uh, to your relationship with the British Museum, you, you joined them in 2003. And that was a very important time for the museum. First of all, because it was its 250th birthday. Uh, what were you planning at that stage? Well, I joined the museum at the beginning of March 2003, in the year of our 250th birthday. And you might think that normally plans would have been laid a long time before that for our birthday. But the, the background to this is that you may remember the British Museum was seen to be a bit kind of fusty, a bit old fashioned, uh, fantastic collection, brilliant curators, great expertise, but not very good at communicating outwards. It coincided also with the time when institutions were coming under the microscope and people were criticizing them. And we were seen to be kind of slightly badly managed. We had a staff deficit, uh, a st a st a deficit. staff morale was low, and we had the ever-present question of the Elgin marbles. So against that glorious background, I joined the British Museum, and the question was, how are we going to celebrate our 250th birthday? Um, and so we really went back to our core purpose, our original purpose, which was to be when we were set up by an act of parliament in 1753, was to be a museum for all studious and curious people, both native and foreign born, for, the edu for their education and, ent and entertainment, and to be free of charge to all citizens of the world. So this is a great ideal of the Enlightenment, an extraordinary, the first museum to be called British, and by British it meant not royal, not private, not the possession of the king, so the possession of the people. So there you have an extraordinary manifesto. So we began to go back to that and think what that might mean. And we had a number of galleries um, planned to open, a number of exhibitions that would talk about the 250th year. But we were slightly set off course because in March 2003, as you probably remember, Britain and America went to war with, in Iraq, a terrible, the, the terrible moment, I suppose. And um, we found ourselves thinking, well, we hold the greatest collection of Mesopotamian antiquities in the world outside of Iraq, which gave us an extraordinary sense of responsibility because in Iraq, while of course the humanitarian crisis was dreadful, there was also behind that a cultural artifacts crisis because the, ob the objects were vulnerable, the archeolog arche archeological sites were, were very exposed. And when Baghdad fell, as you may remember, the museum was left unprotected um, and open for looting. And indeed, it was looted through several days, and there was a big report in the Reuters about the sort of catastrophic looting. It was reported that 270,000 objects had gone from the museum, which really is a kind of major crisis in any terms, but in museum terms, desperate, because this is, in a sense, the memory of Iraq, the memory of that part of the Middle East, where, which was known as a cradle of civilization, a great place. So. 
instead of talking about our 250th birthday, we realized that we had a kind of a, a more important thing to do, a more urgent piece of communication, which was to help highlight what had happened and then to help bring to the public attention the losses from the museum so that um, Interpol and all the government agencies could help in locating objects that had been looted and were being um, traded on the illicit market. So that was one of the things um, that we did. We were also able to send in expertise in the shape of the curators to go and help the colleagues in Baghdad. And again, this is part of our long history of working together with, um, in, in Iraq through excavations and joint research projects. So th I think that this was the beginning of the museum doing something quite different in public. You know, we might have done that kind of thing perhaps more qui pr pri quietly before. So I've been there about two weeks or three weeks, and I found myself having to write about the past of Iraq. We decided to do gallery talks and lunchtime lectures, again, to highlight, to talk about the, the objects in this extraordinary museum, in this extraordinary country. And what we found was that in terms of communication, people responded with huge interest, passionate interest, coming into the museum, coming into the galleries to see these objects. And all of a sudden, you see a different kind of British museum, or I certainly did, which is a museum that is somehow has a relevance, that through, through events in the world today, you might become interested in the past of that country. Um, and perhaps that might shed a light on you know, why we're in, you know, history always does. The complex, you need to understand the complexity behind the stories of today to understand them a bit better. And didn't you also manage to engender within the British media an extraordinary interest in that sense of global historical responsibility that effectively the British Museum was taking. That's, that was exactly that. We had a press conference plan to, to, com to announce our plans for our 250th birthday, and we literally threw away that script. Um, we invited the Secretary of State to the British Museum because what we wanted to do was say, what can the British government now do to help with this crisis? You know, how can we bring together all the different agencies that need to help? How can we document what's happened to the collection? There was, in fact, an, an, a, a stage when the museum was still open and being looted. And with the aid of Channel 4 News um, and the Guardian newspaper, we were able to bring together the, the director of the museum in Baghdad on a then satellite phone in 2003. He didn't have mobile phones in Iraq, a satellite phone. And he was able to tell the curator in London that the museum was still being looted which led to, uh, to extraordinary thing. Neil McGregor, the director of the museum, went to ring up number 10, the, to ring up the prime minister to say something has to be done about this. These objects, this museum must be protected. And protection was then brought in by the Americans. Tanks were brought in so the museum could stop being looted at that stage. And I think that the newspapers really got incredibly kind of interested and excited in the, in the story. So this ran for a, a number of weeks, you know, how many objects have been looted, what we're doing to help find them, you know, what's the state of the storerooms and, and, and so on. And it was, again, surprising to see something like this making the front pages of, of, of newspapers. And extraordinary to think of the, the, uh, the head of a, a museum picking up the phone to the British Prime Minister, who then you know, gets in touch with the, the military authorities and the tanks roll in. Mm. This is a, a situation of extraordinary influence. What does that say about the identity of the British Museum? Maybe the very rapidly growing identity of the British Museum? Well, I think it was a moment when I think we really understood very clearly um, the importance of the role the collection plays in the world. Because if you are going to have, we were always, from the beginning, were the world collection, bringing together the whole world. Part of our imperial history meant that we were traveling all over the world, bringing objects back and so on. But that gives you then a huge responsibility to the world. Holding these collections means you're holding them for other countries, for other communities. We live in a much more globalized world. And um, I think that we really, really had to face up to exactly what it was we, we had to do. And ever since then, we've been building on that, becoming touring exhibitions, of which, which this is one example, touring exhibitions around the world, sharing expertise. Um, we have training programs for curators in India, training programs in London for curators from Sudan to China, Iraq, Iran, because we want to create a worldwide community um, of scholars so that the museum can cooperate with museums all over the world. You talk about uh, your job being, and in this situation, clearly you did manage to uh, engage a great deal of, uh, of public interest and media interest, but more broadly uh, with the museum. 
um, managing to engage that community interest to bring people into an institution and become involved with it. What do you think are the key factors in recent times that you've brought into play to make that successful? Well, I think one of the interesting challenges I didn't mention at the beginning was having a collection of eight million objects is quite a daunting thing to deal with. How do you, as a member of the public, come in and encounter the museum? Now, some people, some tourists come and they say, we're going to do the museum in two hours. You just can't do it. It's impossible. What we want to do is encourage people to come back again and again and look closely at an object. In a way, I remember when we, I joined, people would say, it's a shame you're not more like the Metropolitan Museum. It'd be great if you had works of art on you know, paintings because they are really attractive to look at and people might be really interested in those. The lack of paintings actually made us, forced us to really concentrate on the objects. Now, many of you will know the collection. There are beautiful objects. There are glor huge monumental sculptures that are fantastic. But similarly, there are tiny little potsherds, fragments, old of eye hand axes. These objects you would walk past in a case. You wouldn't necessarily stop and look at them. So we've had to find ways of engaging the public with the idea of objects and the histories they tell and the, the connections they can make around the world. So how that came together in one project was obviously the history of the world in 100 objects at the British Museum. And those objects were really just emblematic of what you could do right across the collection. But it encouraged visitors online and on site to come in and ex look at these objects um, in ways they probably hadn't looked at them before. So that's one way. And another way is putting on exhibitions um, that allow us to explore a culture or, a, a, um, you know, for example, um, we've done Iranian exhibitions. Now, Iranian exhibitions are interesting because we can explore the long past of Iran, ancient Persia, great empire. You know, if the history normally is seen by the, the, the written, those by, the, the conquerors, those who can write it down. So we're able to retrieve those unwritten histories and tell different sorts of stories that shed new lights on, on, on these parts of the world. And that's, so these are the ways that we've begun to try and engage with the world. Engaging with the world and, and engaging with those people who come through the doors of the museum uh, is a, you know, a big challenge, as you say, that's changing in, in recent times. But I was speaking to somebody who'd uh, visited the British Museum just recently and they were saying that the place was just teeming with people. You know, it wasn't a, a series of quiet rooms with people walking slowly through. It was a, a really exciting, active place with lots of people. Why do you think there's that real sense of activity when people get there? Well, I think that's part, but I mean, it, we, we, you know, we're in London, we, we have a global collection, so visitors are, are gonna come, tourists, we're on the tourist map and, and so on. But I think we have seen an extraordinary change in our demographic. We've got a much younger audience. 44, 45% of our audience are aged between 16 and 34, which is a kind of holy grail of any organization to keep young audiences. We also have older audiences, so it's and from many different parts of the world. I think the, thing, I think the exhibitions program has really helped. Um, last year, we put on an exhibition called The Hajj, about the journey, called Journey to the Heart of Islam. This was about the pilgrimage that people make to Mecca. Because again, in a world that we live in, it, it would, we feel it would be good for non-Muslims to understand the, uh, the culture, the religion that we, we really can't experience. None of us, um, unless we're Muslim, can go on Hajj. So this is an opportunity to explore something that we felt was important. And to that exhibition, we were able to attract an audience of nearly half Muslims, which again was, was extraordinary. Eager to come and actually learn about their own history and the stories of Hajj alongside a completely different um, British audience and international audience coming to find out about that. So public program is a very important way, exhibitions, public program debates, um, another way. So in the Iraq story, we, after a, a year or so after this um, story, we put on a debate about what should be done with Saddam's monuments because Saddam Hussein legitimized his regime by posing astride Ishtar gates in art and that kind of thing. So people using, leaders use history to legitimize their own positions. So we examined with Iraqis, with people from Kurdistan, this extraordinary history and what should be done with the monuments. And there was a discussion about whether they should be destroyed or kept. And the young Iraqis said they should be destroyed. We don't want to see any more of Saddam whereas a um, slightly more measured Iraqi said, we must preserve them in a museum because people must come and understand that this is what happens in history and this is how terrible things can, can happen. 
So I think, and I think History of the World has really generated many more visitors to the museum and with this idea of coming frequently, looking at objects. Um, and I think broadcast in general, um, and increasingly museums are becoming cr creators of content themselves, but that is an opportunity, I think, to really engage people with, with, with the collection. And online, we're finding, paradoxically, that the growth of online is driving interest in the real thing. The more people see things online, the more they want to come to the museum and actually just see that object, because the real thing has a, a the real special quality to it, and you can look at it in a new way. You, you mentioned um, the Hajj exhibition, and uh, Britain is a <clears throat> is a now culturally very much more diverse um, community than it was, you know, 250 years ago, 200, 100, uh, even 50 years ago, and here in Australia, there's a, a great deal of of cultural diversity. Um, is it something that you do deliberately to actually perhaps aim or strategize exhibitions towards particular cultural groups in the, in the hope of being more inclusive and, and drawing in those elements of the community? I think that's entirely true. And I think, that we, I think we feel that we need understanding on both sides. Not that I want to polarize that at all. It's just that you know, increasingly in the world, we're hearing, you know, we see what happens in the Middle East. So isn't it therefore important to really understand about these, these different um, different religions. Um, it, you know, we are all living together. It's very important we understand each other. And people are moving around the world much more. Uh, we are living in greater global communities. So it is, I think the, the role that museums can play is incredibly important. I think the other way we look at it is, you know, the rise of China, the rise of India. Isn't that interesting? And so we put on a number of exhibitions uh, about the first emperor of China, which you know, reminds us that China, you know, has struggled in the past to kind of unify itself, to unify its currency. You know, what does that mean? How do you hold a country? How do you reign over a country as, as large and as diverse as that? So we examined that history through, through the exhibition. Um, and as I say, similarly with Iran, with, with Babylon. And we try to mix the, uh, the, the exhibition so that we do cover different parts of the world because, again, we feel we have a responsibility holding this collection to explore these different, these different histories. It was interesting that you were saying uh, that the, the greater proliferation of online material actually made people want to come through the doors and see the physical objects. That almost sounds counterintuitive in this age where, <clears throat> excuse me, in this age where people are so focused on, mm. on what they can find on their smartphones and, mm. and, and so on. Have you taken steps to try to make that connection more, uh, more apparent, more of a, a link? Well, I, this is the challenge of the future, the challenge of now and the challenge of the future. Our first step towards this was the history of the world and 100 objects, the, the radio series, which we made available freely downloadable on iTunes. And it's been downloaded 34 million times. It's utterly extraordinary. And I think what was interesting about that was that people kind of digitally, if you like, by looking online or downloading, they were able to imagine this object and somehow make it their own. When you have an imaginative engagement with something, it's more your own, it, it just seems to belong to yourself more and you want to then go and see it. And that's what all of our research told us about a history of the world. But it was interesting also with the history of the world with 100 objects that you chose to make that as a radio series, not a television series. So we, we, yeah. we didn't get to see the objects. People but were intrigued, perhaps, by the descriptions of them. I think, I think there were lots of people who said, why didn't you make it a television series? It would have been great on telly. But the truth is, you couldn't let... Television would never allow you just to look at one object for 15 minutes while one voice or two voices kind of talked about it. It just wouldn't, mm. it just wouldn't happen. It's counterintuitive. Um, and so we made the images available online, and then people came to the museum and they actually did tours of those objects. They come and do five, one lunchtime, and so on and so on. We didn't put the exhibition, we didn't put the objects together into one exhibition on purpose because we wanted visitors to come and see the object in the context of other objects. And that felt to us like the right way to do it because they could pick up other stories as well. But looking ahead in terms of what we can do digitally, clearly that your handheld device will be able to allow you to engage in different languages and different levels with objects, to find different stories, to personalize the collection, to share the collection. So we see that, that the digital opportunity is extraordinary. Um, you know, that's, it's just something for us to kind of grasp and, and um, make sure that we can deliver 
through you know Wi-Fi infrastructure, but also through the storytelling that we can we can sort of we can bring. And we also are conscious that many of our audiences can't actually visit London necessarily uh, for whatever reason. So the digital museum is really how we take the ultimate step in being the museum of the whole world so that people can, in their own language, access the collection um, online. On a, a slightly more personal level, what, um, what has been really motivating for you about your association with the British Museum? Because, as we heard earlier, you didn't come to the museum with a museum background. You mm. came from a background in publishing. How has that motivation for you built and changed over the years? Well, I, as you can probably see, I kind of couldn't believe that this is what a, what a museum was like when I began, because I just thought it was going to be, you know, a bit slow and a bit, you know, quite challenging, but interesting, you know, a lot to get to grips with. And I think when, you know, you know we're working with Interpol, when, you know, museum curators are coming in from Baghdad to report on the damages, that kind of thing is... We found the world's press, you know, we had 50 film crews, we had 500 journalists from all over the world coming to hear the news at the British Museum, and I thought that is incredibly exciting. We have a huge voice to sort of, important role to play in this kind of thing. Um, and I think it's also surprising that a museum can be nimble. I think that was a real kind of revelation to me. Actually, we can do things quickly. It doesn't all have to take years and years. And I think that the will and the the incredible expertise and support from the curators and the institution has been fantastic, actually eager to help in this, in this endeavor. So it's been, for me, a very exciting journey. And coming from publishing meant that I sort of came from a world of ideas to another different kind of world of ideas. It's not an art world, it's, it's a different kind of world of history and culture and humanity. So that, that's, for me, what is really exciting. And where do you see yourself uh, pushing the museum in the years to come. And I suppose without trying to impose a, a template on, uh, on all uh, museums and galleries and similar institutions, where would you advise other institutions to move towards in the years to come? Well, I think we've touched on digital. That's obviously a, a, cri a critical um, thing. For, for us in the museum, we, don't, we believe in um, cooperation, in collaboration, in sharing, um, because that, that's, we feel that's sort of good for everybody if we can help and also learn from others. So I think that kind of that collaboration, whether it's across the UK or across the world, is, is very vital to us. What we don't believe in is, is creating outposts, the kind of branded British Museum all over the world, because that seems to us to be entirely inappropriate. The wrong model um, in a you know, post-imperial world is not for the British Museum to you know, put a set up a museum here, there, and everywhere. But what we do do is, behind the scenes, we work um, helping museums because what's interesting is the growth of museums being built in China, you know, in the Middle East. We're working in Abu Dhabi helping um, the Emirati Emiratis create their national museum because people need a national museum because they need... It is the memory of their nation. It is the way they understand themselves. It's the way they can think about what their narratives are, what their stories are, and that seems to me to be such a interesting things. So that, those are the sorts of directions we, we, we feel are, are the right way for us to go. You've moved, um, again, becoming a little more personal, you've moved from publishing to the British Museum and without in any way wishing to nudge you out of the, uh, the fine position you occupy, is there perhaps a, um, an aspirational or fantasy direction that you would like to go from here? Can you imagine yourself in some other role that you would just love to do? I find that really hard. I think I've been very fortunate. The only thing I feel I could want in my, in my life or my children's life or my friend's life is to do something I love. So my first job was in Faber and Faber and I worked with wonderful writers, po poets, like the great Seamus Heaney who sadly died yesterday. To me that was so interesting. I, I worked with Ted Hughes on Birthday Letters, the extraordinary book of poems he wrote about his wife, um, his dead wife, uh, Sylvia Plath. I worked with William Golding. You know, to me, that was absolute heaven to work with these great, towering sort of geniuses. I worked with Peter Carey, lots of Australian writers. In fact, Faber was like a mini version of um, the British Museum, but in books, because we like to publish uh, in a small way from all over the world. And then coming to the British Museum was just fantastic. So I have almost no ambition. What I do know <laughs> is I love being in an institution, big or small, and I think, and I love doing something that really matters, that really engages me and I think I've been lucky enough to do it twice in my life. 
I don't know whether I'll ever be lucky enough to do it again. I, I can't envisage it. We'll see. Well, we will see indeed, uh, but certainly you are involved with something that really matters, um, to use your words, and it's been a great uh, pleasure to be able to get an insight into both the British Museum and its Deputy Director. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Joanna Mackle. <laughs>